I'm Yvonne, I'm a third year PhD student from Leicester and I co authored this paper with Ollie Harris. So in this paper we ask a deceptively simple question, what can the body do? Our claim is that answering this question requires shifting our theoretical presuppositions away from ideas of the bounded human body. The approach we advocate draws on a post-humanist feminism and the philosophy of Spinoza and Deleuze. Spinoza offers us an alternative genealogy of the body. Rather than the Cartesian opposition of mind and body, which delivers us over to a transcendent humanism, Spinoza demands a radically specific encounter with bodies without dualism. If Spinoza opens up a space for different kinds of bodies, then we need the tools to map that space. Our tools come from feminist new materialism, which reworks and reassesses the legacy of Spinoza and his 20th century kindred spirit Deleuze. We will outline three key concepts we take from these feminist approaches that allow us to redescribe his, the historical capacities of human bodies, not as transcendent man, but as locally situated and always in the process of becoming. Developing these theoretical approaches is only half the battle. To investigate what it is a body can do, the final part of our paper looks at two archaeological examples. First, the Tintoro mummies from South America, Second, curated remains from Neolithic Britain. We contend that our theoretical approach allows us to describe these bodies in terms that emphasize their nomadic, relational, and emergent characteristics. Let us begin with Spinoza and the critical question he poses, what can a body do? In his ethics, he states, quote, no one has hitherto laid down the limits to the powers of the body. This is no mere appeal to the margins of scientific knowledge, however. The human body is not an entity that one could know in its entirety. Instead, the capacities of the body to affect and be affected, to operate in the world, vary. To quote Spinoza again, bodies are distinguished from one another in respect of motion and rest, quickness and slowness, and not in respect of substance. This requires thinking imminently about the body. Bodies are always emerging, their essence is their emergence. We cannot separate a body from the process of what Deleuze would go on to call its becoming. In turn, Imminence means bodies must always be relational, because they are always already emerging in and through their relations. Spinoza's question was of its time, and today it must be modified. Here, feminism causes us to ask, what can a feminist body do? Our feminism allows thinkers like Rosie Bredotti, Elizabeth Gross, and Claire Colbert. And it's no surprise that they themselves have responded to Spinoza's question. From their work, we draw three critical concepts. The first is the importance of difference as a productive force in the world. Gross, for example, notes how difference has tended to be understood in one of two ways over the last century, using examples from feminism. The first, comparative difference, is when difference between entities is measured or represented according to a third term, a metric to determine relations of more or less. In seeking to provide women with equal and comparative status to men, egalitarian feminism compares the two genders against an idealized humanity. In contrast, constitutive difference, or difference by negation, is favoured within feminisms of difference. Men and women are no longer understood as separate entities, but terms which require each other. Here, woman is not man, thus lacking the characteristics which define man. In each of these instances, difference is not a product of the particularity of a single thing, but rather contingent on bodies in order to provide comparison. In contrast, Gross's use of Deleuze offers us a productive difference, a difference in itself. For Gross, as for Deleuze, difference, or more precisely, differentiation, is how the world comes into existence. Differentiation is not the comparison of two entities, but rather the shaping and forming of the world, as a potter's hands and the clay they hold work together to differentiate form in the process of making. Differential pressures of force and tension operate through the world, producing bodies via the process of difference in itself, Bodies of pots, bodies of people, bodies of thought. Sorry. The second concept comes from Brodotti's focus on nomadic thought and its emphasis on the imminent emergence of subjectivity within unequal power relations. Brodotti's nomadic subject challenges dominant narratives which impose standardized visions of the human. This political commitment is essential to our endeavors as archaeologists. Bredotti's nomadism confronts how our narratives have privileged certain kinds of people. The stories we tell too often focus on what Deleuze and Guattari call majoritarian narratives. Instead, Bredotti urges us to focus on minoritarian approaches, on the possibilities that exist for change and difference. Writing only in the major key prevents us from embracing the differences the past presents and the possibilities for present day change. 
The third concept from Brodossi again is the importance of post-humanism. Post-humanism demands we open up the category of human for analysis. Rather than an ahistorical category, post-humanism post emphasizes that humans emerge in specific contexts and in specific assemblages. Critical here is that post-humanism forces us to embrace the non-human. Bodies are never just the biological matter of our flesh and blood. Our bones and muscles, our synapses and neurons, are formed through our engagements with material things. Archaeologically, this is critical. The non-humans we encounter tell us about the bodies of the past because they are the bodies of the past, bodies that were always more than human. So difference, nomadic subjectivity, and post-humanism. These feminine co concepts open up these feminist concepts open up ways of writing about bodies that celebrate their open, diverse, and contested nature. They let us write differently. They make us act differently. They are the force of difference in itself. To put these ideas to work, we draw on Anna Singh's concept of patches. In The Mushroom at the End of the World, Singh revels in the local, patchy nature of things. Rather than trying to scale up to universal explanations, Singh follows the mycelial connections of her matsutake mushrooms, the rhizome in action. Here we explore our concepts in two separate patches. The aim is to explore what two different kinds of bodies can do and how we can map their capacities. In a moment, we'll examine an example from Neolithic Britain, but first we look at the Chincharo mummies. The Chincharo were a small group of fishers and hunters inhabiting the dry coastal environments of the Atacama Desert in the South Central Andes of Peru and Chile. From the 6th millennium BCE, they began an elaborate practice of artificial mummification that persisted for more than 4,000 years. Since their discovery, scholars have endeavoured to explain the origins and motives behind Chinchoro mummification. Their suggestions range from functional, a way to remove the dead from camp, with Ariaza suggesting that mummification displays an act of love and empathy in the face of death. The most common explanation by far, however, is that Chinchoro participated in the ancestor cult which characterises many Andean societies. To understand Chinchara mummification from a post-humanist position, we need to consider the environment in which these mummies emerged. Recent research has explored the high levels of arsenic in the drinking water and tropic resources consumed by the Chinchara peoples. Arsenic is a colourless, unscented and tasteless poison. Chinchara communities likely ingested arsenic from the contaminated water marine resources. Today, chronic arsenic poisoning, or arsenosis, is known to cause several health problems, from miscarriages to stillbirths, neurological disorders, and many cancers. In the Cameronis Valley, natural water resources exhibit arsenic levels 100 times higher than the 10 mg per litre limit recommended by the World Health Organization. Consequently, the Chinchara miscarriage rate was probably 30 times higher than that of other Andean populations. Kalika's research demonstrates that the more intensive preservation practices are applied only to the youngest and even the premature members of the Chinchara communities. At Cameronis 14, the site with the oldest Chinchara mummies, infant mortality was 20% to 25%. And you can see the mortality curve for mummies from Moro, Moro 1. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. The continual stresses of high infant mortality might have affected and altered Chinchara relationships to death. Ariaza and Standen state that because Chinchara society appears to be non stratified, the complex mortuary treatment of children was a way to resolve parental grief. While this moves the discussion beyond ancestor veneration, it risks treating human emotion in an ahistorical manner. If, if we think in the minor key, we cannot distill this process into maternal grief or a generalised practice of ancestor veneration. A nomadic narrative attends to the distinctive individualised process of mummification. The question is not simply why these bodies were preserved in this way, but what do these bodies do? How do these artificially mummified bodies behave differently to the living? How do the specific compositions of each body act? Why were different animal hides chosen for different mummies? Chinchara mummies were made using a combination of animal and human qualities. For example, Cam 17 T1 C3's trunk was wrapped in animal hides, probably sea lion, while Chin 1 T1 C3 was wrapped in bird hide, and Chin 1 T1 C3 was wrapped in camelid hide. Adult and child remains were often mixed. Neonates and infants were given wigs of human hair, as seen in Moro 1, T25C5, and in one instance a black mummy had adult fingernails superimposed onto the child. To approach these mummies with a focus on post-human productive difference, we must consider what kinds of bodies were emerging. 
The Chinchara mummified body is differentiated from the slow preservation of the naturally mummified dead in very distinct ways. Its boundaries are unfixed. It is as composed of vegetal matter and animal matter as much as human matter, as well as adult and infant animal elements combined. Potentially, mummified infants may have taken on different effects from the animal and human remains they incorporated, becoming something other than human. This alteration of bodily capacities was a renegotiation of corporeality. Furthermore, the specific environment in which these bodies emerged perhaps provided mummies with different affects, adult and animal, which gave them the capacity to withstand the adverse effects of arsenic poisoning. It could have been a reconstitution of group vitality. We now turn to a different patch to ask what can a body do. Here we examine a pair of bodies from the Neolithic site of War Barrow, southern England. Although six bodies were excavated from the central mortuary structure, the two referred to here were deposited in the southwest ditch segment. An adult male, 25 to 35 years old, and an infant. The man died perhaps as many as 100 years before his body was buried, and it remained articulated throughout this time, a potential example of mummification. The man may have died violently, as an arrowhead was found between his ribs. Unfortunately, as the infant was not retained, there is less we can say about them, though their role remains critical, as we will see. To understand these bodies, we need to contrast them with contemporary burials. We do not know what happened to most people in the first half of the fourth millennium in Britain, and variety is the main theme for those we do recover. We have bodies that are buried whole, others that are cremated. Many, however, are disarticulated, broken up whether through exposure, explanation, or the deliberate intervention of people cutting away flesh or allowing animals to consume parts of the dead. The body of the adult at Warbarrow was different. In death, where other bodies began to differentiate themselves from the world of the living, his transformation was slowed. He was differentiated away from the world of the dead and retained within the ebb and flow of the living. Not as disarticulated bone, but as a whole. Neolithic bodies in death could do a great many things. They could be in more than one place at a time through the way they broke into parts. They could become parts of animals. They could become parts of monuments. For a century or more, this body did something different and became something different. The body could do different things. It must have provoked different kinds of memory and recall. This body differentiated itself through the forms of encounter it facilitated and the worlds of the past it brought into being. Yet our emphasis on the minoritarian forces our nomadic gaze away from the adult towards the absent infant. Writing stories of those gone is one of archaeology's strengths. Our reliance on the empirical presence of the man's body, preserved in part because of, 19th century patriar because of the 19th century patriarch, the emphasis of the 19th century, emphasizes precisely why we need feminist thought to, provide us to, to provoke us to think anew. It also demands that we unashamedly speculate. We know the preserved male skeleton had been kept among the living for perhaps more than a century. Was it then the child's death that caused his eventual interment? Did the child's body demand changes? That in order for it to do certain things, the body of the man had to be buried too? Does power reside not in the presence of the only mummified body in Neolithic Britain, but in the more commonplace, but no less effectively powerful, burial of the child. The final element of our conceptual toolbox was post-humanism. What can this offer us here? Two non-humans are immediately critical. The monument of War Barrow itself played a centrifugal role. The effects that flowed through the bodies of the dead as they were interred cannot be understood apart from the non-human body of the barrow. The second non-human is the arrowhead found in the ribs of the adult male. The treatment of the bodies that experienced violence in Neolithic Britain often includes their burial in monuments. Here, we must engage with the possibility that the intersection of human and non-human bodies in the moment of violent death created flows of effect and desire that changed what it was the dead body could do. In Neolithic Britain, just like today, nobody knows what a body could do. By working with bodies in such different ways, however, and exploring radical potential for differentiation that death offered, it is clear that people were very interested in finding out. Here we've shown how bodies are transformative, open, nomadic and becoming, but in different ways. They are historically, loca historically located and contextual. The feminist approach to difference resists the strict categorization of people into different types, be that gendered, cultural or racial. In focusing on emergence, we are encouraged to see bodies as becomings. They are situated and contextual and not measured against transcendent pre-existing categories. Discussing specific bodies in this manner may seem parochial, but that is far from the case. 
Taking this feminist approach is significant not only to our archaeological research, but also to our relationship with the increasingly concerning consequences of the Anthropocene. If we write histories that privilege certain kinds of human with a certain kind of transcendent relationship to the environment, then we naturalise the idea of man as ontologically distinct from the rest of the world. This has huge implications for the way in which we engage with climate change, fostering the idea that a human solution is possible or probable, and ignoring, as Singh would say, the feral entities of human interaction in the world, the unexpected and uncontrolled non-human consequences of our presence in this planet. We live right now in the ruins of global capitalism, and the challenge to, is to learn to live in new ways in those ruins. Here we need to embrace the imminent question, what can a feminist body do?